Hello and welcome to Unheard. I'm Freddie Sayers. As you may have heard, here in Britain we have a new Prime Minister. His name is Rishi Sunak. The last occupant of number 10 Downing Street was essentially forced out by the global financial markets and the media now seems quite content with the former Chancellor of the Exchequer and Goldman Sachs alumnus taking over instead. In a short speech outside Downing Street on Tuesday, he talked of a profound economic crisis. Suddenly, all the talk is of austerity and difficult decisions ahead. Blink, and you might think you were back in 2015 before any of the political chaos even started. There's been a distinct mood shift. The media seem to be breathing a sigh of relief that what they consider to be a more competent, more technocratic, establishment-friendly leader is back in charge. So is it a so-called globalist coup? Or is it just the inevitable result of a new and difficult world? More importantly, what has actually been learnt in terms of political philosophy over the past year, or even the past three or six years? Sometimes it feels so bewildering, where left is right and up is down, that it's impossible to follow what's going on and we sort of shrug our shoulders exhausted. Well, help is here. If there is one person that I would call on to try to make sense of this mess and to try to find philosophical clarity in amongst the chaos, it is John Gray, one of the world's most eminent living philosophers, an authority on the history of ideas and on liberalism in particular, a columnist at the New Statesman magazine, and he's here in the studio. Our agenda today is so ambitious that we're going to divide it into two episodes. The first will focus on the UK, trying to trace the strands of thought that have frayed into the current mess. And in the second, we'll zoom out to look at the wider world and its perils and risks and try to understand how dangerous a situation we really are in and what, if anything, we can do about it. Welcome to Unheard, John. Delightful to be back, Freddie, and to talk with you at Unheard about this confusing and difficult situation. So we have a new Prime Minister. Do you sense that same thing I mentioned there in the introduction, that with Rishi Sunak comes what feels like a mood shift? There's a relief in some quarters. People who were associated with earlier, more technocratic regimes seem to be back in the picture. And it feels a bit like revenge of the technocrats. Do, do you think that's true? I think there's a lot in that. I think um, people who opposed Brexit, people who thought that what government was about was um, uh, fitting into the global financial market and uh, accepted that as a, that, those markets as um, almost um, the rulers of modern politics. They've all re-emerged. George Osborne, um, <clears throat> Hunt, well, probably Jeremy Hunt belongs into that category. But I think the deeper thing is not revenge, it's incomprehension, because the point about these people is they've learned nothing. Uh, there's no practical way of going back before 2016. Um, already in 2016, the world hadn't fully recovered from a uh, near catastrophic financial crisis, which these adults in the room, these extremely intelligent men and women, had given us. Um, um, the, one has to look back at the, the, the halcyon period of technocratic competence. The halcyon period of technocratic competence included, uh, um, going back at the start, I suppose, would be a long-term capital management melting down um, in 1998 after Russia um, defaulted on its, on its debt. That was uh, patched up, but it also began what later be, was called uh, quantitative easing, which is bailing out all the fragile institutions. Um, it was a heavily connected institution if it had gone under other banks, including some central banks of other countries, would have, would have been hit. That's when it all started. You then had the 2007-2008 um, crash, and you also had gruesome sideshows like um, 20 years in Afghanistan. This is what the adults in the room, this is what the technocrats, this is what the uh, the people who, know, who are now coming back as safe hands, as competent administrators, and this is what they did. Um, so the record that their record is not at all one of competence; it's one of repeated near disaster, actually. But there's another aspect of that, which is that the world now is not 
what it was. In fact, it's much more fragile and much more fractured than it was in 2015, even given the earlier financial crisis. We have war in Europe. Um, we have the world economy um, and world markets being severely uh, deflated by Xi Jinping's zero COVID policy, which um, puts a freeze on the Chinese economy, um, which is transmitted out into prices of um, metals and uh, all kinds of things. Of course, we have the underlying um, and, and probably by now unavoidable um, conflict over Taiwan, where the um, high tech uh, um, computer chips on which the whole world economy currently depends emerge. So, so it feels now to anyone watching it without these technocratic uh, spectacles on, it feels much more fragile than in 2015. And yet these um, smarting elites, the elites who were um, kicked out and, and disparaged and not admired and who now want revenge for that loss of status. They don't understand any of this. It seems to me they really believe that um, uh, things can resume where they left off back in 2016. But they can't? No, absolutely not. So you've given us a bit of a preview there. I'd like to just start by understanding the, the local or the, the UK specific disaster or the wheels falling off, because there are two dates. You mentioned 2016, which is where this whole sort of movement began a movement looking for a different world order, really. It was a movement that seemed to be rejecting all of the things you've just listed and saying, no, this isn't good enough. This sort of technocratic mindset misses key important things that we value, and we want something different. And then it rumbled on, and then we had 2019, which again seemed like an optimistic moment, whichever side you are from, because at least there was a resolution and the Boris Johnson victory seemed to point to a new kind of conservatism. There was a lot of talk of this realignment, the Red Wall. It was this sense that maybe there was an answer which could sort of triage between, yes, being market friendly, but also looking after forgotten regions, prioritizing things like control of immigration that were important to people. And it felt like the British Conservative Party, which they have done before, unlike other countries, was going to sort of absorb these populist impulses and turn it into something real. And now fast forward three years and the wheels have just completely come off it. How do you explain that complete abject failure by the British Conservatives? I think one problem is that most of the um, Brexit supporting Tories supported, it, supported Brexit in 2016 and before then for reasons which were wholly different from those which motivated most of the people who voted for Brexit. Um, uh, insofar as Brexit's a Tory project, it is a, glo a global, global Britain, uh, supply-side reform, um, uh, free markets, um, open the British economy even more to the, the buffeting of the world, which, whereas um, um, uh, what people wanted in the North and the Midlands and other parts of the country from Brexit, I think, was some shelter from that storm, from those storms. They wanted not a smaller state, a state that had retreated even further. They wanted actually, maybe not a bigger state, although most of them I think probably did, but one which was more um, protective of them and more um, concerned with their well-being and more uh, active. Um, uh, so I think there's no doubt about that, which is that the majority of those who voted for Brexit did not vote for perhaps the overwhelming majority. Um, uh, for the reasons that the Tory uh, Brexiteers thought. And that, of course, introduced a contradiction in the, in, in the whole um, uh, Tory Brexit project, which is it couldn't work, actually, because uh, if they'd attempted to do what they said they wanted to do, which was to turn uh, the British economy into a free market economy, it would, that would have been rejected. But in fact, they didn't, because, because one of the features of Boris was that um, and both explains his success and his failure, is that he was a, um, um, a contradictory mixture of philosophies and tendencies and projects, which he never really tried to resolve. Um, uh, and one thing he of course, didn't do was to, to make Brexit any kind of success. You couldn't just leave the EU and then carry on as before. You had to, if, you, if you even wanted to 
achieve the, um, the global Britain free market Brexit. You would have had to do all kinds of things, which he didn't do it, any of them of. It's just a kind of vague rhetoric about um, leveling up and, and, and so on and so forth. So I think the, uh, the person who blew it probably most was, was Boris. You've talked about two different Brexits there. If we just deal with them separately to try and get some handle on this. Mm. The so-called global Britain Brexit mm. is epitomised by the Liz Truss 44-day mm. mm. premiership. Absolutely. And in a way, I have some sympathy with the energy behind it mm. because it, is, it was a rebellion of sorts. Against orthodoxy. Against orthodoxy and against this kind of stultifying hybrid technocracy that had been in place for decades. Yes. And I suppose the theory was well, one way Britain can be different is to actually go back to productivity and really you know, boost a business. And we industrialize and, uh... and it just failed. So do you think that version of Brexit could ever have worked? Or do you think now we can say for sure that that was a I think a the global Britain Brexit could never have worked for, for a variety of reasons. The, the changes that would have had to have been introduced into British society, British life, British institutions, British policies, which would be were, were, were radical and deep. Um, uh, we would have had to really compete by exploiting what the economists call regulatory divergence. That's to say, we, rather than actually um, leaving the single market but not differing very much from it, we would have had to do have done something completely different. More like Singapore, but then again, Singapore is not a completely free market experiment. It's very dirigist in some ways. But there would have had to have been a fundamental um, change in um, 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 British economic life if, if we were to reindustrialize, if we were to become high tech, if we were to become a high wage economy. But also, uh, the other difficulty is, I'm, is that uh, that was that vision that uh, was actually not what motivated those who voted for Brexit. So why would they continue? There wasn't the political will. There wasn't the political will in, in, in the, the country. Among, in, the, in the country. And so I'm not one of those who say um, um, Boris Johnson squandered the coalition that he initially achieved. I think the initial coalition was contradictory and fragile. Um, and that it was bound to be to to, to break down sooner or later, um, and maybe um, the trust experiment, short-lived as it was, which lacked Boris's once creative contradictions. I think Boris's temperament was, of course, quite different from Thatcher's. He just thought something will turn up, and I'll deal with it when that happens. Bluff. I'll keep bluffing, but history's up and down. It's unpredictable. It's an ancient pagan view, as you, among others, have. Uh, uh, written Freddie, according to which the the intelligent hum uh, ruler um, uh, parries fate, uh, um, parries destiny, is always flexible and it works for as long as it works. But it doesn't work forever. Didn't didn't work clearly for him long enough. No, not long enough. But again, he didn't learn from that. And I think that the key the key he tried to come back and is been bruised. Uh, and he's back on the lecture circuit probably soon, um, uh, accumulating a little, uh, a little money. But what that showed to me is that the fact that he came back when he did, that he hadn't learned anything. But it's also true that his enemies haven't learned anything. That's the Osborne, the Osborneists, and the um, uh, and the Hunts and the uh, Remainer Tories. They all basically they they see it. It's actually a, a nostalgist vision, oddly enough. They think of themselves as the wave of the future, but the future's melted down, it's not there anymore. Their future's gone. Their future was um, the one they thought was coming into being in 2013, 14, 15, in which the whole world would marketize, in which geopolitics would surrender to geoeconomics, global markets, uh, all, all the states that were emerging, China, Russia, uh, um, and others, would see that their advantage lay with um, integrating into the global market. Um, uh, geopolitical struggles would uh, attenuate. They'll still be there, but they would. Geopolitical struggles would become less important over time. The opposite has happened. The opposite has happened. So, in a world which the world we now face, in which the global market is still exists but is deeply fractured, tremendous problems with supply chains, um, zero COVID in China. Uh, massive sanctions imposed on Russia may not work all that well, actually, but big sanctions 
imposed on Russia. The global market doesn't exist the way it seemed to exist then, and the way it's certainly not evolving towards this mm. global market stability that um, they expected then. So the, the fundamental problem in this um, nostalgist, Osbornist, technocratic project is that the world they were adapting to in 2015 doesn't exist in 2022. They're adapting to a world that no longer exists and isn't coming back. Whatever's going to come uh, will be different, rad is already radically different. It'll be different from even what we have now, because what we have now is a very unstable um, uh, 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 situation in the world in which any number of shocks Military, military shocks, geopolitical shocks, or economic shocks, like the shock of a, a real meltdown on Wall Street, partly caused by very um, uh, um, gung-ho central bank policies, raising interest rates at the point which exposes hundreds of thousands of zombie companies with weak balance sheets, debt all over the place. It we're in a much more fragile situation, even economically, in the world than we were in 2008, so uh, it, it's a hopeless, it's a hopeless nostalgism. That, that, but it'll, it, it'll be good. Let them have their little moment in the sun. It won't last very long. We we dealt there with one version of the kind of Tory Brexit. Mm. I just want to cl mm. clean off this other one mm. because you said that actually this slightly more embracing idea of what the rebellion might look like, where people were more protected against yeah. the buffers and shocks of markets and the global economy, was clearly what people voted for. And that's often said by political scientists. Mm. Uh, there's you know, reports out this week looking at this whole, which has now almost become a cliche of people leaning left on the economy, mm. leaning right on culture and all of that. Why didn't the Tories just do that? And, and why is it that so few populist uprisings, because you can sort of point to Trump mm. as well as a, as a comparator, mm. to actually succeed in delivering that. Mm. And there were people within the Tories, Michael Gove is maybe one of them, we had mm. Cummings there in the, in the beginning, who had a very different vision. Why did that, why did they fail so badly? I think there are several reasons. One is the, the one they themselves give often, which has some truth in it, which is the blob. That's to say, the old elites um, don't want this. They, for them, it's it, it's an assault on their intellectual capital, their reputations, their record of what they've done so far. But it's also a different worldview because it assumes that the world isn't moving towards what um, uh, um, Fukuyama called the end of history, and others have called the end of geography. It's not worth moving on the flat world, the world without friction. It assumes that this whole vision of the world, this whole view of the world, which for many they imbibed at university in the 70s and 80s or, and, and later on, and for them it's, it embodies rationality, it embodies hope, it embodies progress. Uh, for them to accept that, that has to be put on one side. Um, that's not going to happen. That China is not going to converge with the West. That Russia is not going to converge with. It's a huge intellectual um, um, uh, revolution would be demanded, of them, which they're simply um, not capable. The dominant model of the world they have is one in which the rest of um, uh, humanity is catching up with the West. So this is not just in political theory or political philosophy, but social science. If you study why didn't why didn't um, um, Afghanistan become a Western-style democracy. Why didn't it catch up? Well, maybe it was never going to become one. Become something much better than it has become, which is terrible. But maybe it was going to be something completely different. Um, if you think, until very recently, I remember having um, uh, exchanges of one kind or another with people who said that China was on an inexorable evolutionary course to becoming like, like the West. I said, no, it's a series of contingent political decisions in China which could be reversed, when they no longer seem, seem, seem advantageous to, 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 to China. So the first reason um, is, in a sense, they haven't, the, the, the technocrats who are now um, believe they've got a second chance and they're back in the uh, seats of power, um, they haven't got the conceptual equipment to understand that forces other than those that fit into their largely economic view of the world and of human beings themselves, and of human action, it's an economic view of human action, 
isn't realistic and doesn't, doesn't really work. And they can't acquire the skills without taking too much out of their worldview. So that's, that's the first reason. The other reason I would say is that the, um, the, the populists um, um, made errors themselves. I mean, one key error, I suppose, of, uh, of Trump, he could never have done it, but it was, he never built up a cadre or a counter elite of his own. In order to have a revolution, which this is what amounted, I mean, the, the, the populist challenge was almost a revolutionary one. Um, you need cadre, you need, you need um, they were never built up. They were just ephemeral opportunists, ephemeral ideologues, jumping on and lasting. Uh, Scaramucci lasted, what, three days or something? 72 hours. So there almost isn't, wasn't the personnel. There wasn't the intellectual there wasn't, there wasn't the person. And also, it, they were underestimating the difficulty because, of course, um, uh, extracting um, um, a country like Britain, a, a big economy, um, from um, uh, existing economic relationships in Europe and, all, and in the world. It's a big thing. It's a big, it's a big thing to do. It involves tremendous amount of um, uh, uh, um, commitment, which wasn't in the civil servants, wasn't in the political class. But even if it had been, it, it, it's, a, it's a big thing. How do you actually, it may be a problem that no one has solved anywhere. How do you, how do you actually shelter I mean, the fundamental problem of capitalism, global capitalism at the moment, is that it's not consistent with social cohesion in the particular units, the nation states and associated, that make up the world polity. It destroys, it destroys them. But uh, there's no global solution to that. Um, global socialism isn't going to happen. Uh, um, uh, if, if there is any solution, it's a, it's, it's a kind of ex extremely hybrid set of strategies. Maybe like that, the real Singapore, not the imaginary free market Singapore have done, but Singapore is a small city state. That can't be replicated in, so it, it's, it's a very difficult thing to do. But maybe if that had been um, thought about more right earlier on, and if, if the Tory party hadn't been um, befogged in its thinking, by this idea of the, the the liberal lever Brexit, the global Britain Brexit, maybe more could have been done. But this is why people get angry, mm. and there are there is this slightly conspiratorial yeah. atmosphere around this, yeah. and you get Nigel Farage going around saying this has been a globalist coup and all the rest of it. And you might like or not like his choice of language, but the mood behind it, I can understand mm, because yeah. what you've just described is basically an establishment. Yeah and a set of elites yeah. that refused to try out or put in action what people wanted. were voting yeah. for and wanted. And so there is a sense that even for over the past six years, it's, it's like been thrashing against a, a, a wall that refused to budge. First of all, trying to get Brexit done or then trying out these alternative models. And it's almost like these different groups are now exhausted mm. and there's no longer the will or the energy to try. Mm. And the, the world as it was, is trying to reassert itself and claim victory. I mean, am, am I sounding too conspiratorial for your tastes? Well, no, not at all. Um, you're not sounding conspiratorial, Freddie. What you're describing, I think, is the um, the emotional topology of the last um, the year since 2016, which is on the one hand a tremendous blow to the self-esteem, the intellectual capital of people who thought they knew. So the only way they could understand these um, movements, what they called populism, uh, was to say that these are stupid, ignorant people. Um, if any sympathy, if they merit any sympathy, it's that they're being they're being misled by uh, demagogues. Um, uh, but there can be no um, real um, um, merit, no logic, no justice to their to their claims. And so that's what. But that itself was a failure of intelligence. I mean, I think populism is a term liberals apply to the political blowback of their policies that they fail to comprehend. It was, I mean, it was caused by them. If you could go back to the start of Trump, um, uh, whole areas of American society had, had stationary incomes from, for about 20 or 30 years. There were large areas that were being abandoned, and not only abandoned, but uh, regarded by, described publicly, described by uh, progressive politicians with contempt. They're deplorable. They're not only no longer um, economically useful or functional. 
um, they are they are they're despicable because they they want to um, to uh, protect a way of life, an industrial way of life they once have had, and they argue, for example, that maybe uh, um, um, uh, large scale mass immigration might have damaged them in some ways, which it probably did to some extent. There were other reasons, changes in um, energy economy so that mining areas were less profitable and so on, but that was part of the mix, what, what they had. So they were regarded as um, uh, Neanderthal dangerous reactionaries, but I think apart from anything else, apart from, to me, the morally profoundly uh, repellent and even abhorrent attitude, these technocratic, um, these liberals, these progressives, technocratic and otherwise, had for their fellow citizens, apart from that, it was a failure of understanding. Mm. Where did it come from? The devil? Where did this strange sort of uh, diabolical combination of demagoguery and mass stupidity suddenly emerge from? It's a tremendous failure of, um, of intelligence, and it's being repeated. But it's now actually even more absurd, more, more grotesque, more comical, if you can describe a situation so uh, um, humanly um, unsatisfactory as, uh, as a comedy, uh, in that um, they're trying to get back to the situation that existed. Um, before these movements emerged, but it's not only these populist movements, um, which of course have um, re reemerged, if I can put it like that, in places like Italy and Sweden, mm -hmm. where they're part of government now. They're not, uh, um, but it's not just the populist movements, it's the fragmentation of the entire global market order, which has happened since then, in which national and imperial and geopolitical and historic and even religious motives and forces have re-emerged as deciding factors in politics, uh, uh, which it was assumed they wouldn't, uh, that, that wouldn't, wouldn't happen again or would gradually uh, uh, fade away. So they, they've learned nothing. That's the, the, the real thing is that the, the, the bottom line is, this is why the talk of conspiracy uh, um, captures a real mood. You're quite right, Freddie. But it also misreads the situation because these people aren't clever enough to act as com conspirators. They don't understand what they are trying to do. They don't understand anyone who thinks Rishi Sunak is going to uh, be able to um, stabilize the boat of the British economy to the point at which um, uh, um, growth can resume in a few years. I mean, they've only got two years more in office, but anyone is completely delusional because the um, uh, recessionary forces in the put aside even war, the recessionary forces in, in in the world economy are very very strong, and the combination of um, tightening monetary policies with tightening fiscal policies, with higher taxes, lower spending, and cutting back on quantitative easing, can only uh, um, exacerbate all kinds of painful trends for the general population. So it's not going to be politically. Stable. What will probably happen, looking at it from now, from today, uh, October the twenty fifth, um, uh, twenty twenty two, is probably um, uh, a Labour government, um, uh, uh, almost certainly a Labour government. I would say at this at this point, maybe earlier than January twenty twenty five, which is the last minute. I'm not convinced. I'm not persuaded that the internal um, cannibalism of the Conservative Party will permit. Rishi to even last that long, um, there could be another cycle of uh, regicide and uh, um, and folly. Um, uh, but then Labour come in, and then what do they do? Because they are actually also committed to an Osbornist vision. That's the key element of their um, critique. They, say that they, they join with Osborne and with Hunt in saying... And they don't seem to have worked out what's just happened, which is no. by joining the critique that they are being that the Tories were being fiscally yeah. irresponsible yeah. and that the responsible thing is to obey the market to do what the Tories are now going to do the Labour Party has not also constrained itself Very so much. much that they won't be able to do yeah. anything well it'll be constrained by two things one is by what their their response to existing offense and then the, the, the other is by the bond markets again I mean if they did try and do anything else they would be hammered again they won't try so what will happen then now that we're then looking ahead maybe four years from now, almost seems like 400 years, so it's guesswork what, what will you... But I think there'll be a larger political crisis of some kind then. Uh, um, it, it, uh, the failure of Labour will be the point at which um, 
um, to, the failure of labor to deal with this poly crisis, these multiplying crises, with a mixture of uh, austerity, nonsensical new, nonsensical and uh, illusory uh, new green deal. Where's the money gonna come from? Uh, if they do shut down remaining forms of energy uh, production, which they regard as damaging, where are the workers gonna go? Uh, um, uh, it's a complete, a, a mixture of partly embracing the Osbornist consensus and partly be constrained by global markets and partly having um, 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 uh, positive projects uh, that are um, not workable. I mean, by, by two years from now, the likelihood surely uh, is that um, the um, Democrats will be out of power in America, uh, whether or not it's Trump or uh, um, some other more intelligent, actually less narcissistic, more strategically apt. Such as Ron DeSantis, Such as Ron example. DeSantis, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, we'll probably be in power. They'll throw the new Green New Deal out the window. Um, uh, that, will be, that will be over. Um, uh, but in any case, even in the British uh, case, um, uh, there aren't the resources and the economic costs would be too great to do it against the background of severe austerity. But so this, it's actually quite dangerous, yes. then, the situation, yes. because there's, as we talked about, the mood of the, the grown-ups back in charge, but that then they were never grown-ups, mm. and they're even less authoritative and responsible. They're more, bef more befuddled now, even. More befuddled, they're... and also frightened themselves because yes. they know the limitations. Mm. And you're, I think you're right. If we now move from Tories to a Labour government, and they can't do anything either. Mm. Which they, must be the, the likelihood. Which must be the likelihood. There really might be a kind of uprising of mm. some kind. I mean, do you have any confidence that in a UK context, new parties could emerge, new political movements? Because mm. it's sort of dangerous if the system doesn't let them. Well, I hope what will happen is that uh, a crumbling Labour Party, I mean, it may initially have a, majority, a large majority, but we've learned from um, the last, couple of years that a large majority, even a massive majority, is fully compatible with political paralysis and chaos. It's a new lesson we've learned. The assumption was that the British system might be unfair, it might have many things wrong, it would deliver effective government, particularly when you had a, a huge majority, but it hasn't. And it probably won't under Labour, because what will happen to Labour when it stops working, when their mixture of Osbornism and uh, um, green utopianism breaks down uh, is that um, uh, the party will inter begin to internally fracture. Uh, um, uh, the, uh, uh, I don't necessarily mean a, a, a revival of the uh, Corbynites, but there, there are lots of people, must be lots of people within, within Labour uh, um, uh, who uh, are prepared to accept um, uh, the bland um, um, neo-technocratic ideology of uh, Starmerism because they think it's a winning one. And it is a winning one for maybe, probably, if only because the, the, the Conservatives have made such a mess of things and because... It's not loved. It's tolerated, it tolerated. as a vehicle to power. Well, the way so Blairism was... The, the way Blair was, the Blair, Blair was tolerated. Right. He was despised, actually, within the Labour Party very widely, but he was, but he was loved at the same time for bringing them the repeated successes they can. Now, the difference here is this is going to be a much shorter episode. Blairism was successful in several um, elections, and uh, along with Thatcher was the, 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 the kind of the key formative period in British post-war um, uh, political development, if you, if you like. This will be much shorter. I can't, I can't just as I, I'm not confident that the Conservatives will actually last out the two, that the... Uh, the uh, the Rishi regime will last out the full two years. I'm not at all, I'm not at all confident that uh, Labour will uh, after it takes power. So we're talking especially about... if it's a fragile coalition or not a big majority. Even even as you say, even with a big majority, it could be fragile. Well, the best outcome from my point of view, and from and I believe from the point of view of the country, would be if it didn't have a huge majority, so that it has to would have to consider a change in the electoral system. I'm not always. If, um, accepted the first past the post. I used to support back back in the um, 20 or 30 years ago, changes like this, an alternative vote. And so I think now the only way 
that we're going to get fresh thinking um, uh, and, 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 and a prospect of a way through these um, uh, hither, up till now very intractable conjunctions that we face. The failure of the um, Global Britain ex uh, Brexit and the almost non-attempt at the uh, um, uh, more protective and um, 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 state-centered, if you like, um, uh, Brexit that people really wanted. The only way we're going to get through those uh, difficulties is by breaking up the existing uh, party system and having a, a wide variety, a wider variety of parties and ideas. Now, of course, in a way, this is... So Support proportional I do now at this point. I do. I definitely do. It's paradoxical because most of the people who supported, um, not all, but most of the people who supported proportional representation did so because they thought a huge monolithic uh, progressive majority, which was being thwarted under the existing system, would emerge and squeeze out all the things. In other words, they, it would be a kind of thousand year long hegemony. Of the uh, of liberal technocratic centres, exactly the opposite is, is, is the truth. Um, I don't believe there is a progressive majority in Britain, and if there was, it's it's fragmenting. What there is is a majority, I believe, in in uh, against a society in which the market market forces are untrammeled. If you said, well, you know, is there a common view in the British majority about? About anything, and I think actually there is one of the differences between us and the United States. We're much less polarized. Um, uh, ask yourself a, a sort of a question: um, Could the support for the government that dr drop as quickly and dramatically the support for the Tories, in a, uh, as it has done in Britain, if it was the Republicans? It couldn't because actually they're too polarized. The fact that it's dropped so steeply, so quickly, shows that we're less polarized. Shows that we're uh, that this country... Well, there's, there's weaker attachments weaker. to the parties, definitely. And greater political maturity, I would say. Well, what there is is a, a variety of viewpoints. I mean, if you think what well, a variety of viewpoints in Britain, there is Farageist conservatism organised around um, hostility to immigration. There's... Um, Look, just on that, just in parentheses, what's so interesting is Farage is now trying to get going again. He's on manoeuvres. He's doing yeah. a lot of talk of new parties and starting new movements. But he was a full Liz Trussite. I mean, he, he tweeted after the Liz Truss budget that it was the best budget, conservative budget he could remember. So he's not just Thatcherite, he's, he's, he's a Trussite. And which, is, which makes it hard Farage to believe in his... doesn't understand, the contradictions within Brexit run right through him. Mm. I mean, what was it actually that brought down Truss? Part of the story was immigration, because what she wanted to do, partly for cosmetic statistical reasons, because you have, have more immigrants. Economy grows. The economy grows and so on. But also because it was part of her essential vision that um, less restricted immigration, uh, um, uh, or even, I, you know, libertarians would say, uh, un unrestricted immigration was part of the global Britain vision. And so I think Braverman's um, resignation um, Supposedly over, uh, I mean, we're now down to the minutiae of these events, but Brian was supposedly over some technical um, breach of confidentiality rules and emails. It wasn't about that. It, it, it pointed to the deeper contradiction, the deeper contradiction between a, um, a global Britain market liberal, market fundamentalist Brexit of the kind that um, Truss and Farage still support, a small, Brit, a small state Brexit, and the actual one that most people wanted, which did include immigration control. Um, and uh, necessarily, I think, would include that. Um, I reject the idea that uh, demands for um, uh, uh, proper immigration controls are necessarily racist or xenophobic, or um, they, they follow from ideas of um, how to boot, boot up the economy, they, they, their attempts to um, prevent uh, the wages of um, low low wage groups of all different ethnicities being pressed down by, as it happened in America, for example, by large continuous uh, uh, immigration. Um, so um, Farage too, a very important point you made, Freddie. Um, he may try and start some new political movement, but if it's one which is organised around an incoherent um, um, uh, worldview. 
It's uh, not going to get very far. I don't think it is will. Is there anyone? Me. Because I want to I want to zoom out and start looking beyond the UK. But the, yeah. the final thought on that: Do you have any? Is there anyone you are excited about, or do you think there are any kind of alternative movements out there that seem to be getting any? Action? I think the whole, all of the, if we're thinking only now of the democratic world, the world that still has various forms of functioning liberal or illiberal democracy, but anyway, some functioning. Assembly. I don't see very much at the moment. I mean, one, I mean, Macron is an extremely, he's perhaps the most successful of all the, the centrists because he combines an essentially technocratic um, vision with extreme political opportunism and, and, and uh, astuteness. But he's come up against big domestic problems. There's a very large um, um, far right, I think. But so, not in the UK, no. There's, there's nothing there never was in Britain no, so right. far. Then, I mean, mostly didn't get very far in the 1930s. There wasn't a single fascist MP in, um, uh, in, 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 the, in, in the Commons. We've remained actually relatively untouched by that. And, but I see your point because one of the reasons we've remained um, not untouched, but where we've been able to, those um, dangerously anti-liberal movements have been fended off, is that the Conservative Party actually was able to moderate uh, them and um, uh, 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 incorporate them within a broader uh, uh, political project that included social democracy, that included uh, paternalistic high Toryism, which included various strands. If the Conservative Party is going to melt down, which I, I think it's in the process of doing now, then there are obviously uh, risks, even in Britain, um, of something like that happening. You would know much more about this than I do, Freddie, but I don't know if people really 10 or 15 years ago realistically thought that in Sweden there would be a, a government which depended for its support, had a more or less de facto coalition with the far right. But that's the case now, is it not? I mean, there, there'll be a whole argument about whether they are far right yeah. or not anymore. And, you know, we could go down the rabbit hole and that. As in, as in Italy, where they, they say yeah. that they but they, But, you know, the, the, their, their genealogy, let's say, is pretty clear. Thank you, John, for that tour de force of how the UK found itself in this mess. In a few days, we'll post episode number two, in which John looks at the wider world, Ukraine, Russia, the European Union, China, to try to assess how dangerous a position we are in and what, if anything, can be done about it. Thanks for tuning in. This was Unheard.